and welcome to the 30th annual Bug Bowl. Things are a little different this year, so we're doing everything digitally. But one of the biggest hits at every Bug Bowl is always the spiders. We have so many questions about spiders and so many people are interested in spiders. So I wanted to make sure this year we had a day when we could just talk about how cool spiders are. And so to do that, I am joined today by Dr. Sebastian Eshivari, uh, who is joining us here from Pennsylvania. Uh, and yeah. uh, he is going to help us answer some questions about spiders. And so I wanted to start off and have Sebastian introduce himself um, with a question from Elliot in West Lafayette. And Elliot wanted to know, what do arachnologists do and how do you become a spider scientist? Uh, okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Sebastian Echeverri, and I am a spider scientist. I'm so excited to talk about my favorite animals with you today, which are spiders. Um, so arachnologists are a sci type of scientist who ask and answer questions about arachnids. Um, so that includes both spiders and things like uh, scorpions are another type of arachnid. Um, and we want to know lots of different things about these animals. So there are some arachnologists that ask how these animals evolved. Who are their, their relatives? Um, there are other arachnologists that ask, okay, wh why do they live where they do? What adaptations do they have that help them in different environments? Um, and as for me, I'm a spider scientist that's really interested in how spiders talk to each other. So I studied how and why jumping spiders, so this one right here, um, get their audience's attention when they're performing their wonderful courtship dances, because jumping spiders are very famous for being very colorful and also really good dancers and singers. Um, and you become a spider scientist by starting to ask questions about spiders. So hopefully a lot of our audience today might be taking their first steps uh, to asking questions about spiders. And then you start trying to find answers. Um, you can find answers by asking other people, but at a certain point you'll get to a point where there, no one knows the answer. And then you have to start doing science, which is a process uh, it's a system of, of asking the right questions and setting up experiments that let us see whether or not our ideas about what might be going on are consistent with what we see or not. Um, and so we, we use a scientific method to answer questions. And so I, um, in particular, I did uh, my undergrad. So I went to the University of Miami and I studied biology and applied physics, but I had no idea I wanted to be a spider scientist at that point. I wasn't scared of spiders, but I didn't know too much about them. Um, and it was only when I applied to start my PhD, because I knew I wanted to study animals, that I started really learning about spiders and how, how cool they were. And I was like, oh my God, okay, I can't not learn about like why this spider is so like colorful and like why it dances the way it does. Um, and so it's becoming, a, there are a lot of different ways. So, you know, some people are spider scientists that haven't gone through um, a, a graduate school like I did. If you are out there asking questions about spiders, learning from other people, and using the scientific method to answer those questions, you're a spider scientist. So Elliot also wanted to know where the coolest place you did research was. Mm. Oh man. Um, so I have been through all throughout like the American Southwest because that's where the species that I study, the fiery haired paradise jumping spider or Habronotus pyrethrix, um, that's where they like to live. Um, but my, the coolest place that I went looking for these spiders um, is probably, oh, we drove through a lot of states. Um, when we were in Colorado, um, we went to the Great Sand Dunes National Park, mm. uh, which is an environment that looks unreal. Like it's a sand dune smack in the middle. It looks like, you know, something out of like the Sahara smack in the middle of the United States uh, next to like a snow capped mountain. Um, and we were, we didn't really know what would be there, but we found jumping spiders living in little plant, like in sand dunes in like little like valleys within the sand dunes. Um, of the same genus, the Habronatus genus. And that probably was the coolest place. Um, 
So I'm an entomologist and I study insects. And one of the questions we get a lot is why, this is bug bowl, so why are we talking about spiders? Because spiders are not insects. So That's can okay. you tell us a little bit about how spiders and insects are related? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, so spiders and insects are both a type of an animal called an arthropod. It's like, think of it like a genre of animal. It's like a <laughs> one kind of general idea of what an animal works like, but there are a lot of different variations within that. And within um, arthropods, there's two groups. There's the insects and spiders are, and other arachnids, um, which are actually in part of a, a large group called chalicerates, but we'll focus on just the arachnids. I think a lot of people think that they are closely related because they're about the same size most of the time and they both have exoskeletons. Um, and so, you know, if you don't take a really close look, if you haven't had the opportunity to do so, it makes sense that you might think that they're really, really similar to each other. Um, but the cool thing is that when you start looking at these animals' evolutionary history and how their body works and like how their bodies put together, turns out they are vastly different types of animals. So one of my favorite things that I learned recently is that everyone watching this live stream right now, all of you humans, you are more closely related to dinosaurs, frogs, uh, sharks, lampreys, all other fish, any animal with a backbone, you're more closely related to them than any spider is to any insect. So the last time that spiders and insects uh, were related to each other, the last time they shared DNA, their last common ancestor, lived over 500 million years ago. That's before like dinosaurs were even an idea. We even like, like anything close to that was like out there. Um, and so they have been evolving separately for all this time. And it shows up in how radically different their bodies are set up. So I'll use my... Um, model jumping spider here. Um, arachnids, or spiders in particular, but arachnids, many of them, um, they don't have the same number of legs and body parts as insects do. So most, or like all insects basically have three body parts. They have their head, their thorax, which is the part of the middle where all the legs are attached, and then their abdomen. Um, jumping spiders are very different. I mean, spiders and arachnids, um, if you look at the bottom of a spider, um, you'll see that on their head, so the head part with their eyes and brain and everything, on the bottom, that's where all their legs are attached. So they've got those eight legs for walking, and arachnids also have two kind of arms called pedipalps. Um, and so they have, they're attached to their head, and their abdomen is actually just full of like a bunch of organs, um, like their heart and their lungs. And a lot of those organs are set up differently. They work differently. You know, spiders um, don't have compound eyes. They have multiple eyes, but they're not compound eyes like an insect. And so once you take a close look, almost every part of their body works differently. Um, and it's just an evidence of how different they are. They're their own, arachnids are kind of their own type of animal. Um, there's a lot of different ones in, besides just spiders and scorpions that really like play with that body plan. Um, but yeah, they are like this radically different, weird type of animal that's really cool that we can observe both that and insects, animals that are so distantly related just by going outside. So one of the biggest questions that we get about spiders um, at Bug Bowl and just any time that I'm out talking to folks is, will it kill me? And there's, there's a mm -hmm. lot of fear about spiders. Yeah. And I, um, can you tell us a little bit? I mean, I say this too very often, um, but yeah, they're pretty gentle animals in my experience. Yeah. Absolutely. So this is also a question that I get a lot. And it makes sense because in our society, in our culture, we don't have a lot of opportunities to have positive experiences with spiders. You know, we see them maybe at night uh, or like they're scurrying around and they startle us. And the other times that we get a chance to learn about them is maybe in a news story or on TV or in a movie, but often those are really negative portrayals that are there to like sell tickets or get people's attention, but not necessarily to report on the truth. Uh, and so I don't blame anyone for having these fears. It's our society has like taught us that this is how you react to this animal. 
But then when you get to know them, when you get up close to a spider, um, think, let's think about it from their perspective. They are, at their size, really great predators. And they've evolved to have venom. Most, almost all spiders have venom that catches their food, um, that helps them catch their food. But there are no spiders in the entire world that eat humans, none at all. Yeah. Um, so their venom has not evolved to do any damage to us. If it happens, it's almost always by accident. Um, and there are very few spiders that have venom that's actually strong enough to do anything to humans because there's two reasons. One, uh, we are like a skyscraper to a spider. We are uh, like a building size thing that they have trouble comprehending is an animal. Um, and so our bodies are so huge that their venom often just isn't enough to do anything. I usually um, tell people also, that we're just really noisy trees as far as a spider is concerned. Yeah. <laughs> Even like my ju like jumping spiders, which are really visual and like often are more aware of you, I don't think they fully put together that our different parts of our body are like the same thing. Because like they'll react to my hand and my arm, but like my head, I don't think, and my other arm, I don't think they realize that it's like the same like continuous object. Um, it's very funny. And then spiders that like can't see very well just really don't know what you are. Um, so they're scared of you. Their venom doesn't work on you uh, because it, again, it's evolved to catch things their size. Um, and so their response, they want to survive. I mean, they've been around for 300 plus million years. They wouldn't have got here if they just went uh, attacking animals that could squish them easily. So they're evolutionary drive is to survive and it's to get away. If you give a spider the opportunity, all 99 times out of 100, it's going to try to run. Yeah. And when it doesn't, it's because it doesn't feel like it has the opportunity to. Um, and so out of all the spiders in the United States, there's only two types that actually have venom that's anywhere uh, near what we call medically significant. So like, if you were to be bit by the spider, you should go to the doctor. And a doctor will be able to take care of you. There haven't been any deaths from these spiders in a very long time because we know how to treat them, treat the, the venom. Uh, and they don't bite very often. So these are the black widow, which are a black spider with like a red marking on its abdomen. And then the brown recluse, which is often confused by other spiders, but they're really, if you look at them up close, they've got uh, six eyes as opposed to eight, and they're not very hairy. So that's what, two easy ways to see. And they don't actually live everywhere. So there are places where there are neither black widows and, or brown recluses. Here in Pennsylvania, there are no brown recluses. Um, and we only have black widows kind of spatch, they're, they're spotty, they're like here and there. So I tell people, whenever you see a spider, you only need to learn two types of spiders, those, those two. If you see any other spider, harmless to you. And yeah. you can just observe it, ignore it, like take it out of your house or just, you know, let watch it safely. Yeah. I've got um, one of our tarantulas, Rosie here, sitting on my arm. And oh, let's see adorable. if I can move her a little so that you can get a better look at her. Um, so Rosie is sitting, oops, this side. <laughs> <laughs> Rosie is sitting, basically her fangs are right on my finger. She's not hurting yeah. me. And so um, here, we'll make sure you get enough support there. Uh, so what a I kind of tell people to think of spiders the same way that you would think of a cat or a dog, um, or for yeah. that matter, any other wild animal. If you're not hurting it, it's not going to bite you. If yeah. you do hurt it, well, you know, don't, don't want none, don't start none. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like so as long as you're animal. not hurting them, they will not hurt you. And also, let's see if we could get, will you give Ooh. us some silk, Rosie? She sure did. Can you guys get a shot of that? can just barely see it on that one. Back yeah. Then. So it's really cool. So that's how sweet she is. Um, she's a Chilean rosehair. I can't remember if I said that before. Um, but she's basically gentle enough that I can pull silk out of her bottom. Mm -hmm. And she's not. She's fine. And she's I will fine. say, like, spiders are individuals. There are some yes. Chilean rosehairs that don't like to be handled. And you just give them the respect and space that they want. Right. And they won't go after you. Uh, but a lot of them are really calm, and if you approach them in the right way um, and take, don't move too fast, moving fast is often an easy way to scare a spider. Yeah. Um, they'll be really calm. 
Yep. You know, a lot of people at, like, are scared because, you know, spiders have venom um, and fangs, but that's just a part of their body. Like there are, you know, thousands of all mammals have jaws and that could bite you. Um, but very few would bite you, and even smaller of those, the bite would actually be something that you'd be worried about. Um, so it's just like any other animal, like you, if you treat them with respect, they are not going to hurt you, and they'll be much happier because they are honestly terrified of you. Yeah. Yeah, the spiders that we have here at Purdue that we use in our education programs, um, we spend a lot of time working with them and getting them used to being with humans. Um, mm -hmm. And also, we were talking earlier, so our spiders have a job. Their job is education. And she is going to get a vacation because she got used in a program. So she'll get three weeks off before she has to go meet people again. Um, so we try really hard to not stress our spiders out. Um, normally, handling a tarantula is not encouraged. But these guys, we work with a lot, and we, we treat them very gently. So she's okay with it. So I'm going to put her back. And let's see what was. Um, let's see. So in Indiana, one of the things I hear a lot is a lot of people um, say, oh, I saw daddy long legs. And they're so mm -hmm. dangerous, but their fangs are so small, they can't bite you. That's a myth. And it's actually incorrect in a lot of ways scientifically. Can you talk with us a little bit about, honestly, you do not have to be afraid of daddy long legs or harvest man, which is another name. Oh, for yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to. In fact, I'm going to try to switch my video over and okay. show you some of the differences between a spider um, and a daddy <laughs> long legs or their, their technical name is a harvester or an opilionid. Um, so let's see if I can get this working, because if I do, it'll be very cool. <laughs> All right, so I just have to put him in focus here. Uh, and... There we go. Yep. Okay, so this is a preserved specimen of an opilion. Now, this is probably one of the ones that it's common in many places in yeah. the, at least I know in the eastern United States, yes. you might have seen something that looks like this. They are a different type of arachnid. Remember how I mentioned before there are other arachnids between spiders and scorpions? Daddy long legs uh, are their own type of arachnid. And you can tell that because their bodies are really different. So <laughs> unlike spiders, which have two parts of their body, these animals, they're just one big ball with the legs sticking out. So here, if we're looking at one from the <laughs> side, it's just their abdomen and their head have kind of fused together over time and they're just one big ball. So if you don't see an abdomen, it's not a spider. Right, so, um, so and, daddy long legs and harvestmen are not spiders. That's correct, Right. yeah, they are their own type of arachnid called a harvestman or an opilionid is the scientific name for them. Um, they also only have, let's see if I can get in focus better, <laughs> um, two kinds of eyes, I can, they only have two eyes usually. There's two eyes that are sticking out of um, the top of their head, and maybe I can, do I have a pen that I can point them out with? Maybe. <laughs> right about there. Those are the eyes right there, the little bump. So that's another way. There are spiders that only have two eyes, but the vast majority have more, and all harvesters have two or less. Um, and the last thing is how they eat their food. So you know how spiders have fangs? Well, harvesters, I don't know if we can see them because they're yeah, folded that's up. That's perfect. Um, but they have, instead of fangs, they have, basically they're like these little like pinchers, like kind of tiny, tiny crab claws. I think of them as like tiny food scissors and they don't have a venom. So they, it's true. The part of the, the myth that says I eat you, that is true, they don't have fangs. Um, they have these uh, tiny little pincers that they use to slowly break up little bits of food. And instead of being um, hunters like spiders, most of them are scavengers. So they will hunt some small things. Um, and they're kind of omnivores. They'll just like eat kind of little bits of everything. And they can actually eat solid food as opposed to spiders, which can only really drink liquefied food. And so they're really different. They're very cool. If you see them walking around, 
they're often feeling around with their legs because they, their, their primary sense is, is touch. Mm -hmm. And they actually also smell through their legs. Um, they're very cool animals. And I wish I knew more about them because there are some out there that look really cool. Yeah. Uh, there are some ones in like New Zealand that get really, they're like, they have these huge arms and they get like, they're spiky to defend themselves. Fascinating animals. Um, actually, there are some of them where the parents will actually protect and care for the eggs. They'll like make little like burrows and the, the fathers will like stand watch over the eggs. They're fascinating animals, but not spiders. Okay. And they don't have venom. Okay, great. So everybody, now you know you can relax. Don't worry about the daddy long legs. Um, but check them out. They're really cool. But they are super cool, yes. And so, so you were saying that spiders can only eat um, liquid food. Mm -hmm. And so since we were talking about how the um, daddy long legs, the harvestmen, don't have fangs, um, yeah. I thought, let's talk a little bit more. So I actually have some fangs here. Oh, awesome. So this is the shed skin of a tarantula. So you can see inside, Gorgeous. but this is the best way to get a look at a tarantula's fangs. Um, so tell us a little bit more about the fangs and how they work in, in spider feeding. Yeah, so the, the fangs are the way that spiders catch their food. Um, so they are, they have like two sections. There's like the top part, and then there's a lower, the kind of the sharp part at the bottom. And they can, it's actually like a joint. They can kind of like move their fangs mm -hmm. up and down. Um, and when they bite their food, there are tiny little openings at the tip of the fangs that um, feed into the venom glands, which are in the spider's head, like right behind the base of the fangs. Um, and the spider will uh, squeeze out venom into the thing that it's bitten. And that venom is something that usually it's paralyzing and it's killing its food. Uh, but then after the food has been uh, killed and it's ready to be eaten, the spider has a problem. Uh, because, like I said, they actually can't eat solid food. It's only milkshakes. It's the only thing they're going, smoothies and milkshakes all the way. Um, so they have to basically turn solid food into liquid food. Now, you do that in your stomach, right? You eat solid food, and then in your stomach, it gets liquefied, and then you can digest it. The spider does that on the outside. So some of the venom starts breaking up stuff, but then they will also actually vomit out juices and like proteins um, that are going to be breaking down that food and they'll spit that out on their food and they'll hold it and it'll slowly become liquid and they'll actually hold it um, to their mouth. And so spiders do have a mouth. It's not, they don't drink through their fangs. It's a one way venom out only tube. They have a separate mouth that it's basically a straw um, and then they just drink up their milkshake and that's how they eat. <laughs> um, and actually the cool thing is it has to go all the way through their head into their abdomen because their stomach or their, their intestines where they absorb the food, it's like all the way in the back in their abdomen. So this tube goes through their head all the way back into the abdomen and that's where it gets digested. Um, and they have this really cool thing. Um, do you have one on your end or should I show mine? I have the, one the if stomach? I can get them here. Okay, so I'll can you there. guys focus right there. <laughs> I'll see if I can get mine on as well. Um, let's see. So that little thing that is sticking up. So we said that spiders have an exoskeleton just like um, insects do and they shed that exoskeleton. But because their exoskeleton actually goes inside their body, parts of their body so they shed their, the lenses of their eyes, but they also shed part of their sucking stomach. Um, because they have these muscles, it's got to have something hard to attach to, and that's what it is. And here, Sebastian has another one. That yeah. we can, uh, I should say Dr. Sebastian. <laughs> you can call me Sebastian. Um, um, that's totally fine. Okay, so what I'm showing you here, this is a shed skin of one of my tarantulas, <laughs> and I'll point out the sucking stomach here, though. It is right there. That is the sucking stomach. Um, that little thing that's, and so that will lead into um, their mouth, which maybe if I turn this around, mm -hmm. you can see their mouth is, is uh, oh, no, I'm losing the focus. Hold on. Hold on, <laughs> I can do this. 
<laughs> yeah, so there's the sucking stomach. It's that little part that's sticking out. And it's a tube that goes down into their mouth, which is kind of like at the bottom of their, like, at the bottom of their head. Like, uh, you really can't see it very clearly unless yeah. you uh, flip your spider over and kind of move their, their like, the base of their fangs and petty palps aside. Um, and it's just a tiny little straw-like opening, and that's how they, mm -hmm. that's how they eat. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, and since, since we're talking about the exoskeleton, um, mm. can you talk about what, so when they shed, what is, because yeah. I always think of it as like if you had to take off eight pairs of jeggings at once. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of a big deal for an animal this oh, size yeah. to completely take all that off. Yeah, it's hard. So I'll show you a bit. Um, I can bring this over to my main camera. Um, so this is, a sh like I said, a shed skin. And you'll see like this. So this stuff here at the bottom. Oh, it's focusing on my face. Um, <laughs> those openings go all the way into their legs. So they have to shimmy out of their old skeleton. Because spiders like other ar arthropods, they're the hard part of their bodies on the outside, which is really great for like defense and you're like a tough animal. But when you need to grow bigger, um, you can't because you're limited, right? And so they actually, they squeeze out and they have to like, if you've ever seen a video of that, and there's some really nice videos and gifts of yeah. like a tarantula molting, they will like flip on their back and like slowly push themselves out of their clothes or their old clothes. And then they're very soft. And this is the trick to growing bigger. They start out very soft right after they molt and then they will actually kind of puff up a little bit um, and then it'll harden. The exoskeleton will harden over the course of a, a few hours or maybe a day or so. And when it hardens, that's the size that it'll be until the next time that they molt. Yeah. So they, they are growing that new exoskeleton underneath their old one. Um, and it fits in because it's, it's a little stretchy. And then when they get out, they, they'll like, they use, um, they kind of squeeze out their um, their blood to push out those segments mm -hmm. uh, because spiders are on their like their blood kind of goes through all the all through their body and it's like a pressurized suit so like if they're under like high pressure so they can kind of squeeze on that and then they'll expand a little bit it'll harden and that's how they get bigger so it's this whole process it's one of the few times where spiders and other arthropods are kind of most vulnerable because they're soft and they're they're really their fangs aren't hard enough right because the fangs have to harden too they can't defend themselves, um, and they'll often spend that time being very, very scared of the world, which, you know, <laughs> I understand. Seems if I had, like, a time every few months where, like, I was just a, just a soft jelly mess, um, I'd also try to hide from the world during those times. Okay, some of us really identify with that a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how long do spiders live? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, because it's one of the things that we've learned about recently. Um, and also one of the things that like varies a lot throughout spiders. So I haven't said this yet. Uh, we've talked about spiders, like there's like a few, right? There are approximately 50,000 different species of spiders that we know about. And there are more that we know are probably out there that we just haven't gone out and discovered yet. Um, so there are spiders that are radically different from each other. Um, and so just like that, their lifestyles are also different and they, their lifespans are also different. So let's take, for example, a tarantula. Tarantulas <laughs> and tarantula-like spiders called mygalomorphs. Um, the spiders that kind of look like they're big, they're chonky, they're slow moving. Um, these types of spiders tend to live a very long time. So the world record of longest spider that we know about is a trapdoor spider um, from Australia that lived to be 41 years old. And we know that because a very dedicated scientist uh, spent their life going back to this trapdoor's burrow and making sure that it was there every year uh, until it finally passed away. So they can live a very long time. Um, tarantulas like the rose hair that we just met can live easily into their 30s. Uh, or at least the females can, because yeah. often male spiders will have much shorter lifespans. Um, they, once they reach uh, maturity, they will go out and look for a female to be able to mate and reproduce. And then after that, they often pass away. 
um, they kind of put all their energy into traveling, you know, very big distances for a spider um, to find someone else because often these animals don't live close to each other. Um, and after they've done that, they're usually kind of out of energy and they have a lot of, even if they survive longer, people who like have them as pets, they have trouble molting into their, the next molt and they often pass away. On the other hand, there are a lot of spiders like jumping spiders and wolf spiders and most spiders that you see, what we call typical spiders or Araneid spiders. Um, they will have usually much shorter lifespans. So a jumping spider, oh my, I lost my jumping spider. <laughs> a jumping spider uh, like this one will have about a year maybe um, or somewhere a few months under that, depending on whether it's in the wild or in captivity. Um, some other spiders will live to a couple of years, like they will go through a few winters, but they do not get to be um, very old for the most part. They're, there's often, they're reproducing every year and there, there's kind of new generations often coming out. Tarantulas, on the other hand, reproduce very rarely. It's only when they're often much older and it, it's not a frequent thing. And so these two like different ways of life are kind of the, the two ones that you see with spiders. So I actually, when you said tarantulas reproduce, I actually have. Mm. This feels like a tiny cotton ball. <laughs> it is an egg case from one of our tarantulas. Um, it That's turned awesome. out that they didn't hatch, uh, but her second egg case did a lot better. Um, oh, yeah. But it is the softest thing you have ever felt. And when the little spiderlings come out, it's got to be like being in a nice silk sleeping bag while they're getting ready to develop. Yeah, so that's another really cool thing that spiders do with their silk. Um, so all spiders can make silk, but they use it in different ways. Tarantulas, for example, one of the things that they do is they'll just lay silk on the ground around their house, like the entrance of their house, and they kind of use that to feel vibrations better. But they don't make like a web like you would think of a web in the air. Um, but they also use their silk to wrap their eggs, which is something that I think all spiders do, as far as I know. Yeah. Um, because it's such a strong material, it keeps the eggs safe and keeps stuff from getting in, and, but it's still soft so it doesn't hurt them. Um, it's this really cool thing to see all the different ways that spiders use silk. Like jumping spiders use them um, as like anchors when they're jumping, so they'll leave a piece of silk from their abdomen <laughs> on, like they'll touch their abdomen to uh, what they're gonna jump from, and then they jump and then they have a safety line. So if they fall, they can just climb their silk back up to where they started. Um, and of course there are spiders that build webs in the air, there are spiders that build um, webs that they throw. So like net casting spiders will throw a web. Um, there are spiders that build uh, webs that are like booby traps that are like kind of like spring loaded with like little um, sticky bits of glue at the bottom that like pull up a prey. There's so many different types of webs. I like, I'm still learning about more of them. Um, it's really cool. So each spider will use their web, their silk very differently, which is one of the, the fun things to see in different species. So a lot of people are interested in having spiders as pets. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what spiders make good pets and what you should look yeah. for? Absolutely. So there are um, kind of two most popular types of spider pets that I've seen. The two ones that I would recommend just in general are tarantulas, which is my number one recommendation. And then some people, now it's becoming a little more popular that some jumping spiders are being bred and sold as pets. Um, and my, those are, those are the two big ones. I'll start with tarantulas because I have a lot of tarantulas and they make really wonderful pets um, because they are an animal that for the most part, depending on the species you get, they don't need a lot of care. They need to be fed about maybe once a week. Their environment needs to be maintained in whatever they, you know, what their species has evolved to live in. Um, and they need a, a bowl of water. And that's about it. Uh, and they need a place to hide. So they like to be, be able to like pr cover themselves up and protect themselves. Mm -hmm. But that's about it. They um, are really easy once you get them set up and they are really fun some, in that um, you can really watch them grow. So, you know, a baby, you can get tarantula babies that like start about like this size and they'll get to like a spider that's like that big and you get to watch them grow. So in the background over there, 
I don't know if you can see it in oh because my camera won't focus because it's looking at my face um, <laughs> I've got a wall full of shed skins at, as my tarantulas grow the species that I recommend for people um, to start out with so if you're looking to get into uh, keeping my tarantulas are the ones that don't need a lot of moisture and um, ones that are from um, uh, the Americas, so Central and South America, and North, there are some in North America too. Um, and the ones that tend to have a reputation for being calmer, like the rose hair tarantula that we saw there, in, saw earlier. Uh, the species that I would say are my um, recommendations are the curly hair tarantula. That's mm -hmm. my number one recommendation. They're like um, little teddy bears with eight legs. Oh my gosh. So I'm very upset because both of mine are preparing to molt. Oh, at yeah. You for outreach. And they're both <laughs> preparing to molt, so they're hiding. So I can't show you, but they are incredibly cute. And like, they're actually like Everyone just like trust us. Balls. They're cute as the Dickens. <laughs> you can Google, will, Google will, will confirm this for me. Google curly hair tarantula. Um, so there's a couple of things that make them great. They don't need their habitat to be kept particularly moist. Um, once they grow out of their like tiny little baby stage, um, when they're babies, you do want to have a little bit of moisture in their, their soil. Um, but once they grow out of that, as long as you have a water dish in there, they'll be fine. Um, they tend to be really calm. Most of the ones that I've heard of people having, and both of mine, very calm spiders. I can kind of scoot them out onto my hand and like put them somewhere and use them for shows. And they will just kind of sit there um, looking adorable. And they also, um, spiders from the Americas have, tend to have much weaker venom. Um, True. so that even if on the, like, I very, there's very unlikely that the spider would bite you, but on the off chance that something happened, you accidentally scared it and it's trying to defend themselves, that bite will not be very strong. So there's no real risk. I gotta um, say, I've been working with tarantulas for 30 years and I have never, ever yeah. been bitten. And I kind of yeah. have it, a lot of tarantulas. It's pretty <laughs> hard. If you, if you, again, if you treat them with respect yes. and like, when they're scared, you just give them space. Yes. That's all. They're not going to come after you. They're just going to yeah. be, be happy to have their space. Which is, I think, so, true of, oh, sorry. I was going to say, no, that's no, go ahead, go ahead. true of all animals. That yeah, just respect exactly. them, give them their space. Yeah, the, yeah. the other thing, um, for viewers who are interested in getting a pet tarantula, if you look at our website, we have some suggestions on species that you want to look for. Oh, wonderful. Um, the other thing to really think carefully about is to make sure that you have a captive bred yes, tarantula to say that. because there's actually a black market in grabbing and smuggling tarantulas from the wild and in some cases for a few species particularly from India and a couple other places um, it's actually contributed to the decline of the species so um, we will also post on our social media streams some resources to help you know if the tarantula that you have is captive bred, but it's a great question to always ask. Yeah, so we're kind that is of, really oh, important. Oh, sorry. I was gonna say, we're, um, we're kind of coming towards the end of our time okay. together here. So oh, I no. wanted to say, what is your favorite spider? Oh my God, that is the hard, okay. <laughs> this is very hard because I have to pick between a bunch of spiders that I really, really love. And then I learn about a new spider and then I'm like, maybe that wasn't my favorite. <laughs> so for a long time, my favorite spider, uh, don't tell the jumping spiders I said this, don't, okay. just don't tell them. Because um, jumping, by the way, spiders can hear sounds in the air. Don't mm -hmm. tell them I said this. Um, it was a type of trapdoor spider called um, the Lephistius genus of trapdoor spiders. These are spiders that they're, they are uh, spiders that look really similar to like ancient fossilized spiders. Mm -hmm. So they have like an armored abdomen and their eyes are really weird and their spinnerets are on the bottom of their abdomen. They look really strange. Um, and I like them because they, they resemble what the ancestor of most modern spiders might have looked like. Um, but then I recently learned about, like, um, there's a spider. Okay, this is a really cool one. There's a spider that lives in coral um, at, like, the right about the, like, water level line. And it'll actually make a little trap door in, like, a little, like, polyp, like, uh, of coral. And it will... When the tide comes up, it like closes its trap door. What? And it lives there like underwater for most of the day. And then when the tide goes down, it pops out and starts hunting. And like 
<laughs> that's amazing. I, that's I amazing. I didn't know there were spiders that did that. So this is the problem is that it's always changing. I'm sure if you get back to me in like a month, um, I'll have found out about a new type of spider that I'm like, okay, look, you have to, you have to know about this. <laughs> See that, that is for me, one of the reasons why I love being in entomology because every single day we find mm -hmm. out something new about, oh my gosh, this, here's this amazing cool bug. Here's this amazing cool spider. Um, so anything else that you want to tell us? Okay. Um, I, there's a lot of things that I could say about spiders. Um, I will say, just to give you a sense of like how successful they are as animals, uh, there's a jumping spider that lives on the slopes of Mount Everest. It is the highest permanent resident wow. of any animal on Earth that we know of. To put it another way, it is the animal that is closest to space <laughs> on average of any animal. Because about there's, a, there's you know a couple humans in space, but most humans are on the ground. Uh, and so this spider is the closest animal to space. Um, and that still blows my mind. I, I, I just love telling people that. I think I would, one thing that I would say to people, if any of this sounds fun or any of this was like, kind of blew your mind a little bit, <laughs> when you go outside next time, try looking at the small animals, like spiders and insects and um, roly polies because you'll be amazed at how many different species you see once you start realizing that most animals are a lot smaller than like a squirrel or a mouse. Um, and you get to watch all of these really cool behaviors just all around you. You don't have to go to like the jungle in South America or something to see ridiculously cool animal behaviors or rare animals or even new species of animals. There are new species of spiders being found all across uh, the United States, like every year. You know, when I went to look for my spiders, I ran into a species that at the time hadn't been described by scientists. Um, you can just do that. Like it, this idea that like that adventure is out there has been like a really wonderful thing to me. And I hopefully that resonates with some people mm -hmm. out there. And if you have any questions about spiders or you see a cool spider or anything, uh, you can message me or Purdue or Gwen or just yeah. anyone. We're always happy to like. Yeah, you, if you've got spider questions, we are going to, yeah. as soon as we get done today, we're going to go through. And I didn't get any notifications of questions while we were having the stream, but I will go and check and answer all of those questions. If you think of a question you haven't had answered yet, bugbowl at purdue.edu. I also go. wanted to point out a couple of really great books. Um, that you can find in your local library. The Next Time You See a Spider Web is a lovely book um, to read with your kids and is a great introduction to all the different kinds of spider webs. And oh, another I book I'm my friends who have kids. that this is from our very own Tippecanoe Library. I'm trying to love spiders. If you want to like spiders, but you're not 100% sure you're there yet, this is another great, fun book to read with your kids. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us. We could probably keep going about spiders for I, many, I do many this, hours. Yeah, I could do this forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you so much for joining us, and thank you to everybody at home. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for uh, letting me be a part of Bug Bowl. It's so wonderful to see celebrations of <laughs> insects and spiders like this. And I hope you learned a lot, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.